Hey, it's Craig. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Canadian History X early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Greetings and welcome to another episode of Canadian History X. If you like, you can support the podcast for as little as $3 a month. Just go to patreon.com slash Canada EHX. You can also donate to the podcast by going to CanadaEHX.com and clicking donate, or you can go to buy me a cup of coffee slash Craig U. All of these links are also in my show notes. And for people who donate, I have various levels of benefits. For $5, you get a thank you at the start of the next episode of Canadian History X, Canada's Great War, and from John to Justin, and on social media. For $10, you get everything from the $5, plus this episode is sponsored by, with your name at the start. Also, I'll state it's sponsored by you on social media. For $20, everything from the $5 and $10, plus a second episode sponsored by you, and promotion of something you're working on. And for $50, everything from the $5, $10, and $20 plus, you get to choose a topic for me to cover on Canadian History X. If you like, you can email me at craig at canadaehx.com. You can find me on Twitter. My handle is Craig Baird, C-R-A-I-G-B-A-I-R-D. And I'm on Instagram and TikTok where I put up daily videos about Canada's history. Just go to my username, Bairdo37. And you can find weekly videos on Canada's history on my YouTube channel. Just go to youtube.com slash c slash Canadian History X. If you want to find transcripts of every episode I've ever done, you can go to my website, canadaehx.com. And there's over 700 posts on Canada's history there. The area that currently is home to Bruderheim was for centuries the land that the Indigenous occupied. The primary Indigenous groups of the area were the Blackfoot and the Cree, who had often come into conflict over territory. The area was also the upper reaches of the territory of the Plains Bison, which were an incredibly important animal to the indigenous. Today, Bruderheim sits on Treaty 6 land. Before there was a Bruderheim, there was the home of Andreas Lige. Located about two kilometers away from the current site of Bruderheim, this was the first place of worship in the area. Lige served as the lay pastor in his native Russia from 1878 to 1892, and he was instrumental in helping to bring more settlers to the area in 1894. In 1895, the local congregation was established in the community with 44 adults, 16 young adults, and 51 children. This would not be the only congregation that Lilge would start. He would also help to organize the Bethlehem and Bethany Lutheran churches. The community of Bruderheim would spring up for the most part thanks to the railroad. It was in 1905 that the railroad was built from Vermilion to Edmonton, and this gave the area of Bruderheim a new link to the outside world. With the railroad, the village site was laid out along the tracks, and the name itself comes from two words, both German. The first, Bruder, means brother, while Heim means home. Together they mean home of the brother. The momentous day came on November 8, 1905 at 10 a.m., when the population of the entire area came out to greet the train as it arrived. In 1920, the Mallon Windmill was built by William Mallon. The mill was used to grind rye into flour and feed for animals, as well as to saw wood. Built of local wood itself, the grinder stones were pulled from the North Saskatchewan River and chiseled on the ground by hand. The mill would be used in Bruderheim for three decades until it was moved south of the community. It would later be purchased and completely restored by Heritage Park in Calgary, and today it continues to sit at the park, a great link for the Bruderheim found in southern Alberta. One of the most important industries in Bruderheim in its early history was the cheese factory. This factory, built in 1923, was incredibly important to the local farmers because it reduced their travel distance to market by dozens of kilometers. The church factory would play a vital role in the growth of Bruderheim and the local farming and livestock industry of the area. In 1917, a small school was built called the Hilliard School, and it would serve the area until 1941 when it was replaced with a new two-room school. This new school would continue to operate despite falling enrollment until 1964 when it closed. In 1928, the eminent architectural firm of MacDonald Magoon designed Walker School, which would serve the Bruderheim School District. The previous school, built in 1914, was too small and now found itself in the borders of Bruderheim. This school, which was four rooms, was built and opened the following year. The school featured separate boy and girl playrooms downstairs, while the classrooms, a science room, and a staff room were located upstairs. The school was one of the largest in the area for its time, and it would serve as an example for future schools in the province. As for its name, that came in honor of Frank Walker, who was the member of the provincial legislature for the area. 
Walker School would continue to operate for several decades, but eventually the number of students in the area necessitated the need for school to expand. This was done by transporting the aforementioned Hilliard School from 36 kilometers away and attaching it to the Walker School to add needed classroom space in 1971. The new expanded school operated until 1978. The school would then be renovated and become the Town Hall of Bruderheim. It is also the location of the community's library, and in 1989, it was made a registered historic resource. The Walker School Museum also operates out of the building now, and tours are available to learn more about the history of the community and the school. Just to the south of Bruderheim, there is Elk Island National Park. This park, called an Island of Conservation, is the eighth smallest national park in Canada, but the largest fully enclosed national park in the country. Within those 194 square kilometers, there is the densest population of hoofed mammals in Canada, including coyote, moose, lynx, beaver, elk, and of course, bison. The area of the park has been used by the indigenous for centuries, and over 200 archaeological remains of campsites and stone tool making sites have been found in the park. After Europeans arrived, the area was used for hunting and timber harvesting until a fire tore through in 1899. At that point, the federal government designed the area as the Cooking Lake Forest Reserve. The trees were now protected, but the elk, moose, and deer were not. In 1906, five men from the area put forward $5,000 and petitioned the federal government to create an elk sanctuary. Called Elk Park, it was given federal park status in 1913 and became an official national park in 1930. In 1907, the Canadian government bought one of the last and largest remaining purebred bison herds from a herd in Montana. Soon after, nearly 400 bison were shipped to Elk Island and then moved to the Buffalo Park near Wainwright. Not all of the bison made the journey, and about 50 to 70 evaded capture and stayed within the park. These escapees are the ancestors of the 400 purebred plains bison and 300 wood bison that now live within the park. The success of bison in the park has allowed bison to be reintroduced to several places including northeastern Montana, Alaska, and the Russian Federation. While the bison history of the park is interesting, what I'm going to talk about now is the Ukrainian home within the park. In 1951, this replica pioneer cabin was built to honor the Ukrainian Canadians who pioneered the area. The pioneer home is a one-story rectangular log structure that has been covered over with white plaster. Ukrainian people came to the area in high numbers during the first few decades of the 20th century, and the homes they built are quite similar to the one that was built in the Elk Island Park. The heritage designation of the building states, quote, The Pioneer Home is a very good and attractive example of the traditional form and plan of a Ukrainian homestead. This building also illustrates the settlement patterns of Ukrainians in western Canada as this region developed at the turn of the century, end quote. The building has remained unchanged since its construction, and the home has become a landmark of the area. The landscape around it includes aspen, poplar, and spruce trees, with a great view of the lake. Another thing that makes this building historic is that it was the first museum or historic site ever dedicated to Ukrainian immigration in Canada. 1993 would be designated as a federal heritage building, and when it opened in 1951, it was opened by Prime Minister Louis Saint Laurent. In 1919, a home was built on the Prashnow homestead where a 1915 granary already sat. In 1929, a flour mill addition would be added. One year later, a summer kitchen was constructed. The homestead had been built up by Ludwig Prashnow, who had been given the quarter section from his father. Ludwig had come with his family from Russia, one of 14 Morovian farm families who settled in the area. Ludwig would invest heavily into his farm in the early years, including adding a sawmill to the property. He would do custom threshing for his neighbors and saw lumber for them, helping to build up the surrounding area of Bruderheim. The Prashnow homestead exists to this day and is an excellent example of early settlement buildings in the area and the resilience of the early settlers of Alberta. Bruderheim, like so many other communities in Canada, was hit hard by the Spanish flu in 1918 and 1919. The flu would rage through the community, causing many to fall sick. The most common symptom for people was a sore throat, fever, and in some cases even bleeding from the nose and mouth. In the most severe cases, the flu was fatal. At the Victoria Hotel, which was built in 1906 by the Klaus family, there had been several bachelors living in it, and when the Spanish flu hit, many of those men became sick. The hotel would be turned into a temporary hospital for the community, and those bachelors who were renting rooms were now patients. For three weeks, Bruderheim also quarantined itself from the rest of Alberta, and the roads into the community were even roped off to prevent people from coming and going. 
the local police would bring in medicine and thermometers for the community. And while these measures were taken and likely saved many lives, 11 people still died from the flu. In 1945, Bruderheim gained praise from across Canada for the community's efforts to knit socks and more for the soldiers. It was reported that over the course of 1944, the community had knitted 147 pieces for soldiers, including sleepers, sheets, socks, sweaters, baby wear, and other articles. Every Wednesday night, the local Red Cross held meetings where people came out to knit. Jack Pennell, for his part, knitted 52 pairs of socks. This was impressive considering the entire community knitted 56 socks. Three students at Walker School also knitted a baby quilt. In 1950, the prosperity of Bruderheim was guaranteed for decades to come when oil was found nearby to the community. The town would adopt a new slogan to honor this prosperity, which was, Watch the new oil field grow. Around the area, leases by the provincial government were being sold, and a small oil boom was expected for the community. The Edmonton Journal would report, quote, Talk of oil is heard almost everywhere in the town of about 200 people. The talk picks up volume as it spreads to the surrounding district where every farmer, either surface rights owner or mineral rights owner, is vitally interested in the new development. End quote. On May 12, 1952, Bruderheim was rocked by an explosion at Nering's garage that began a four hour fire that was fought by the fire department of the community. The explosion had been caused when the mechanic completed a welding job on the exhaust of a car when the uncooled torch was dipped into a pail containing a flammable liquid. The mechanics in the shop were not injured, and while the garage was completely destroyed, firefighters were able to keep the blaze from spreading to other parts of the community. Dick Croning, a member of the Le Mans Fire Department, was injured when his hand was severely cut while fighting the fire. Albert Strauss led the way to fight the fire after the alarm call came in as he was returning home from his work. He rushed his men together to fight the flames, and as mayor, he also requested assistance from other firefighting crews from nearby communities. Strauss would say, quote, the whole garage was roaring. We had about 20 firefighters on the job, and as we went after the main flames, we were forced to keep a close check on the houses to the west for fear that the flames would spread. The residents of the houses started moving their valuables as soon as the first alarm was turned in. End quote. Not only was Strauss the fire chief and the mayor, but he was also the chief of police, which helped him mobilize local officers. Mrs. R. Christie would say of the fire, quote, The smoke was terrific. It was pouring out through the two large garage doors. End quote. In all, the fire cost $30,000 in damages, which would be about $302,000 today. On March 4, 1960, at 1.06 a.m., a 4.6 billion year journey came to an end when a meteorite streaked through the skies of Alberta and exploded as it entered the atmosphere at a speed of 42 kilometers per second. The sound wave was audible across 5,000 square kilometers, sending 700 fragments of the meteorite weighing in at 303 kilograms across the landscape. The shockwave was powerful enough to shake the foundations of homes, rattle windows, and wake many families up from their sleep. The shards of the meteorite landed just north of Bruderheim, with some forming pits as deep as one foot. Once news broke of the meteorite, people came out to look for fragments. The first fragment was found on the farm of Nick Broda. Other farmers began to find fragments on their property, with the largest weighing in at 66 pounds. That piece left a hole two feet wide and one foot deep. Stan Walker and Ty Balako recovered 155 pounds of meteorite on their properties. The total amount of fragments was the largest recovered fall in Canadian history. Now called the Bruderheim meteorite, it was a crondite or stony meteorite composed of a metallic nickel iron olivine and orthoprioxene. The largest piece of the meteorite would become one of only 16 to be recovered in Alberta and is now part of the Geological Survey of Canada's National Meteorite Collection. Other pieces can be found at the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History, the American Museum of Natural History, the Vatican Meteorite Collection, and the Department of Earth Sciences at Cambridge. On August 2, 1978, Bruderheim would get a very important visitor when Queen Elizabeth II and her husband, Prince Philip, arrived in the community as part of their tour of Western Canada for the Commonwealth Games in Edmonton. Mayor Jim O'Hara was given the honour of welcoming the Queen to the community and he would say, quote, I was nervous until I met the Queen. She puts you at ease just like an old friend. End quote. Mona Beauville would say of meeting Prince Philip, quote, I can't get over him. He's so relaxed and friendly. End quote. While the visit was only 10 minutes, it would be something the residents would remember for the rest of their lives. The Canadian National Railway Station site where she met with residents would be named Queen's Park, a name that remains today, and Main Street was renamed Queen Street. In 2006, the town began working with the Spring Creek Green Team and the Communities in Bloom local chapter 
to create the beautiful Spring Creek wetland area. This project consisted of building plant beds for native plants to the area and constructing a wetland interpretive center. With funding from companies and through grants, the project was completed and has become a significant environmental resource for Bruderheim. In the native plant beds, there are five beds that reflect the vegetation that existed in the Bruderheim area prior to settlement. Within the beds, there are trembling aspen, snowberry, nuttall sunflower, purple prairie clover, and blue gramma grasses. Many of the plants were sourced from as far away as 100 kilometers, and interpretive signs at the plant beds describe the plants and their importance to the area. At the Wetland Interpretive Center, there are six interpretive panels that detail the importance of wetlands and how they are used by wildlife. If you'd like to learn more about the history of Bruderheim, a great way to do it is through the Bruderheim Heritage Trail. This trail takes you through the community's history from Brookside Park to the Spring Creek Wetland Interpretive Center into Old Town and then over to the West Woodlands area of the community. I hope you enjoyed that episode of my look at Bruderheim. If you did, please leave a rating and review. If you like, you can email me at craig at canadaehx.com. You can find me on Twitter. My handle is Craig Baird, C-R-A-I-G-B-A-I-R-D, and I'm on Instagram at Bairdo37. As well, again, if you want to support the podcast, you can for as little as $3 a month. Just go to patreon.com slash canadaehx. And you can donate to the podcast by going to canadaehx.com and clicking donate. I'd also like to thank all of my wonderful patrons, and I apologize if I get any names incorrect. Michael Matthews, Joanna Parker, Jeff Dahl, Vobs, Robert Page, Richard D., Colin Johnson, Jeff Hershey, Kyle Murray, Steve Pakin, Matthew Gartho, Lionel Romaine, Dr. Bob Turner, an anonymous patron that I truly do appreciate, Randy Hayden, Doug Campbell, Reg W., Deborah Carlson, Francis Helbling, Nick Zinri, Shannon Marshall, Clinton Martinez, Dimitri Shove, Aaron O'Hara Myers, Robert Dunseith, Todd Casey, Catherine Rawa, Luke S., J.P. Bear, Jason Hall, Phil Maynard, and Iris Gray. Thanks, and we'll see you again next time.